Welcome along to episode 790 of the Mill Bar. Jason Forrest here with you as ever. And coming up on the show this week, we'll be hearing from Billy J. Kramer about his latest music and having a bit of a natter about his, what, 60-odd year career. Cultural Dramatic Society will be letting us know about Curtain Up on Murder, their latest production. We'll be talking to Paul Chuckle and the team from Co-op Funeral Care about how funerals are actually turning out to be more brighter coloured and Almost fun celebrations of life these days. Harry Matthews lets us know about his work. We'll be sharing some poetry from him. The Enfield Poltergeist is also a topic of discussion, as we'll be finding out about that show that's at the Newhampton Arts Centre as well. That's all on the way on the show this week. Welcome to the Milk Bar. 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 Uh, welcome to the milk bar. Uh. Consul Dramatic Society have Curtain Up on Murder as their next production, and too many people in one frame on the Zoom conversation. <laughs> uh, so we, we, let's see, we've got Andy, John, and who else have we got? We've got Kelsey, uh, Patrick, Nigel, Kira, and Jackie in that order on my screen. Is that right? Yep, yeah, perfect. It's the opposite way around to you, which is really confusing. So, <laughs> he- hello, gang. Hello. Right, we'll start with the directors, Kelsey and Nigel, co-directing this one. And uh, Kelsey, uh, we can just about see you uh, with, a, with there's a lovely smile there. So, t- t- first, will you tell us what it's like being a director for the first time, and is Nigel helping or hindering? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want the truth? No. Um, it's great. It's good fun. I've been with the society for six years now, mm-hmm. and so this is my first time directing. So it's it's good fun, and yeah, Nigel's great. <laughs> and, and, oh, that's good. They're normally keeping the prop code out the back. Is that what you're trying to tell us? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nigel, what's it like on, on this one? Because it's a, it's it's a big show, isn't it? You got quite a cast. Yeah, it's a big cast. Yeah, I, well, I, I, I remember. Yes, but they're all uh, they're all very good. They're all um, they're all very professional. And they're, you know, they've done an awful lot of this, so they you know they they good at what they do, really. So it's making it's making our, our job quite um, a lot easier, really. I'm, I'm um, not, so, not keen yeah. on that, to be honest with you. I was hoping they're going to work you hard, but. <laughs> okay, so uh, we, we're going to work our way around, and I'm going to go by character name. I think I will ask for Martin next. Okay, so John, tell us about being Martin. A bit about Martin. <laughs> He's a director um, in the play. He's di- directing on stage, so to speak. Um, he's a bit of a grumpy soul. <laughs> um, Podcast, um, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and um, he has his, his suspicions about what his wife might be up to. <laughs> oh, okay. Right, so it's getting intriguing. Uh, where are we going to go next? I think we'll go Kira. Hello. Hey. Right, what are you doing then? Come on, tell us more about you. Uh, I, I play Ginny. She yeah, is, no, is this someone know. who likes gin? Is that how it works? <laughs> <laughs> That's in real life. Yeah, I, 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 I wish, um, I, might, I might have to tell the directors I need some gin on stage. Um, no, so I am a very naive individual who is not part of of the society that is in the show has come along and kind of gets pulled into a, a whirlwind as the as a twist happens throughout the show so Ooh. yeah it's very interesting we like twists twists are good um uh patrick uh, aka harry yeah well i'm the caretaker or i appear to be the caretaker but because wally's been taken bad so uh um, there's more to it and there's uh, lots mm-hmm. of uh, Bits in the plot that are a bit uh, complicated. Intriguing. Yeah, yeah. Intriguing. Yeah, no spoilers. Yeah, no spoilers. It, it helps you guys having the script, doesn't it? But there we go. And uh, <laughs> I mean, Jackie, um, do we have to find a role where your hair colour suits, or are you going to change your hair colour to suit the role? <laughs> it's, it's Sil- Sylvia, I mean, Sylvia is a bit like Salvia. Salvia's a red, I and mean, you're a bit. <laughs> Uh, scarlet in the hair department at the minute. Slightly pinky at the moment. Yeah, I never keep my hair the same colour for more than a roll, I like to think. But um, <laughs> So I am playing Sylvia and I am Martin's wife, the one who may or may not be hiding some secrets, particularly with the lovely Alex, played <laughs> by our lovely Andy. Um, so I'm the lead female actor 
in the performances, not just because I'm married to the director, I would like to add, but <laughs> um, she's a really interesting character. She's a bit more um, feisty than other roles I've played, I would say, and I'm really enjoying getting to know her and, uh, and bring her to life. This should be good. Okay, he's sort of hanging half out of shot at the moment. I can see his left eye. Uh, Andy, Andy <laughs> Alex, Alex, Andy, oh, come on, tell us, tell us what you've got going on. Uh, well, I, I don't know if you've sort of gone into this before, but we're we play an amateur group that's been locked in their theatre, and then slowly, one by one, their secrets start to get revealed, and people start dying. <laughs> mm, yeah. So yeah. Uh, I'm heavily involved in the secrets that have been going on. Um, Trists get found out and um, secrets come out and then you, you start to understand that lots of different people have motives. So it's trying to work out how it's going to end in the uh, the end of the play. OK, well, so well, I think we've, we've got a good general idea of what's happening or some intrigue, at least around the uh, the plot. <laughs> And uh, this this one, it's uh, it was Wednesday the 18th through to Friday the 20th of September at 7.30. Then Saturday the 21st at 2.30, the traditional Consul Dramatic Society Saturday matinee. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this is, uh, it, it, it sounds like uh, a fun play as well as being serious. Because I mean, so, some plays you do are completely straight. Others, they're just absolutely laugh a minute. What's this one? Where does it sit? It's, 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 it's in the middle. It's in the middle, yeah. yeah. yeah some quite tense, quite serious moments, and then you, you have your laugh out loud yeah, moments. with a bit yeah. of comedy, yeah. Comedy then, moments, yeah. Definitely a moment where you, you're going to be on the edge of your seat. Yeah. Yeah. Moments, yeah. yeah. And have a few, a few right. chilling and that's not just because you've given us really narrow seats for this one day. No, you? not for <laughs> But I think for, for actors, it's really interesting to be able to, like, straddle in both camps as mm. well. You can really find different yeah. ways to act and yeah. interact with the other people on the stage. It's a great cast that we've got here, and it's really interesting to explore those different ways of performing with each other. It, it's always a great cast. It's Consul Dramatic Society. We expect <laughs> nothing less than a great cast. Uh, but uh, intriguingly, uh, judging by the poster, there's a peer involved. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. how do you recreate that in a village hall? You're not digging a moat, are you? It's a theatre at the end of the pier. Yeah. Throw so, a fish on yeah. stage. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the, the the team will be working behind the scenes to make the front of the scene look like the scene is supposed to look like in a theatre yeah. with the scenery. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. I, I think think we've got that, and uh, that there will not be whelks during the interval either. That's the other thing we need to add. <laughs> No, that, that would be bad. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the, we've done the all important. Wednesday the 18th through to Saturday the 21st. Wednesday through Friday, your 7.30pm do. The matinee on Saturday at 2.30. Uh, so who wants to tell me where you can get tickets from? Because I've got it written in front of me, but it's more fun when we make you do it. <laughs> so, um, so you can get your tickets at consuldramaticsociety.co.uk or you can call our hotline number on 01902 267 322. Go and sing it for us. <laughs> Please also check out our Facebook page and you'll find some more intriguing little hints as we go along. Okay. It's, it's good good. And, and, and you can see the pictures of the rest of the cast who we couldn't quite fit in the picture without dangling from the roof of the bunting that's behind us. <laughs> so it is Consult of Society, Curtain Up on Murder. These guys are going to get on with the rehearsal now. Thank you for joining us. Have a brilliant time. Break a leg and don't fall off the pier. <laughs> Thank you. Good to see you. Now, somebody who's released a brand new album is an absolute legend from the world of rock and roll. His name, Billy J. Kramer, and he joins me now for a chat. Hello, sir. How are you doing? I'm very well, sir. How are you today? I am good. Now, this is nothing new for you to be releasing music. It's something you've been doing for many more than 60 years. And uh, yeah. but a, a joy to have a new album out and, and one which marked a very special anniversary for you. It was um, my 60th anniversary of being in, in show business. And uh, we had a big party at Abbey Road in London. And um, 
we, we did a show in the studio, Studio Two, uh, the famous studio, and then we went on to record a new album. And all of that uh, is you know, just such an important way to mark what has been an amazing career and still continues to be. Uh, but, I mean, the, the first man to have a number one song with the Beatles track uh, with uh, Lennon McCartney writing uh, a, a bit of secret or two that some of you were trying to keep. Uh, and way back when, I mean, you were initially working on the on the railways. Uh, it could have been a very different career if you if you hadn't stepped up in front of a microphone. Well, it could have been a different career. I'll be honest with you. I, 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 I'm, I'm very fortunate that things worked out for me because I don't think I've done well. I was I was a, a trainee engineer for British Rail. Uh, during the day, and I was doing gigs at night, but I, th I think I was doing too many gigs and not concentrating on on engineering. So uh, I think once I I would have uh, qualified, I, I don't think I'd have qualified. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but no one's complaining about the career path you've taken. But I mean, it, it's it's great to look back and and look forward with the music as well. But uh, I mean, fr from those initial days, uh, it, sort of making your way in the music industry at a time when the sound of Liverpool was absolutely rocking the world, it must have been so enjoyable to be to be part of the scene, but still very very hard work. It was hard work, but it was very fast. It was very exciting, um, but it, it it was there was a, a lot of stress involved. You know, it was. <laughs> But I mean, it sounds like Bad to Me and Little Children. Uh, I mean, I grew up listening to those. You've got many generations of fans now, and uh, that, that must be great when you do get a chance to, to, to perform live. Are you, are you doing many actual big live gigs at the minute? Um, I'm doing some. But I'm, I'm not doing a, a tour, just a, just one-off gigs, you know. Um, but I'm doing things like, you know, I'm doing the Fest for Beatle fans here in August. I'm coming over and doing an interview at the Beatle Museum. Um, in Liverpool on August 26th, which is going to be interesting, you know. And you know, I mean, very much part of the scene though, because obviously you're friends with John Lennon, uh, you knew all the lads in the Beatles, and uh, you know, they, they even helped form the, your stage name. Yeah, John Lennon. It was John Lennon who came up with it. He, he, he suggested the, to add the J. You know, just before I released "You Want to Know a Secret," was playing Billy Kramer, and then I went to Brian Epstein's office one day, and he said. John, as, as a suggestion, I suppose, he says, add a J to your name. And that's what we did. I said, I'll keep it, you know. But, but where does the Kramer come from? You know, what happened was the first band I was ever in said, we're going to have a stage name. And they 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 dreamt up 12 names, and they called up a telephone operator, asked her what she thought was the best, and she picked Billy Kramer. So that's, that's how they did it. I knew it had to be Billy something, because that, that is my name. Yeah, you you wouldn't want to change that, but it'd be too confusing, wouldn't it? Yeah, a bit confusing, yes. <laughs> so, with the uh, the music that you've got here now, this latest album, um, how did the songwriting come about? Um, it, it it came about to me pretty late on. I I uh, used to go to place, I used to go to Santa Fe in New Mexico a lot, and um, um, it's the land of enchantment. And I, and I it came about when actually. I, I sat one day and I thought, you know, Brian Epstein had been kind of cold shouldered by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And I wrote a song called Liverpool with Love, which eventually got him in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And I wrote The Sunsets of Santa Fe. On the new album, I wrote Be Kind to Emma and Peace of Mind. You've never shied away from singing a song by another writer as well. I mean, this is part of what you, you've, you've done as your back catalogue, although you did turn down yesterday, didn't you, when when uh, Paul McCartney offered you that one? Well, uh, you know, at the time, I'll be honest with you, I just had a hit with trains, boats and planes, and I didn't want to do another ballad. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'll never live that down. But uh, but even so, though, I mean, I, I think it, it not being... It being a Beatles song that we know is a Beatles song and not one of the Billy J. Kramer back catalogue, I think, I think the world would be a different place if it, if it hadn't been you know, Paul and John and, and, and Ringo and George who we heard producing that one. I think you made the right choice for music and uh, yet there are so many other great songs that you've, you've released. I mean, to have turned down one like that, I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's part of life's history, isn't it? Part of life's history, and you know something, I couldn't have done it as well as, Paul did it, so there you go. 
Uh, I'm not so sure about that. I think you you would uh, do a, a fantastic job with I mean, every piece of music you come to, and and just hearing your mellifluous tones now. I mean, your your voice is, sounds fantastic. Dare I ask how many years you've been using it now? Uh, over sixty. Over <laughs> how, years. how old are you now? Is it 80? 81 next 80. month. Right, I, th- I thought it was around out there. But, uh, I mean, we, we'd be lucky to have so many uh, amazing bands and, and, and singers from the 60s still performing. And there's something special about you lads from Liverpool. You just keep going, don't you? We have to. We're, we're, we're made of tough stuff. You know? <laughs> and, uh, I mean, how often do you get back to Liverpool these days? Is it so, so you're not living that way out there, are you? No, I, I live in uh, Chicago, you know. Um, I, I was back in Liverpool three times last year. I'll be going again in a couple of weeks' time to do this gig at the museum, you know. Um, I've got family there. I've got a brother and a sister still there, you know. Liverpool changes so much. I, I went to university up there 30 years ago, and the changes I've seen from from then, and the way the city sort of developed, but still got a powerful music scene to this day. Oh, it's still got a powerful music scene. And it's grown. It's grown so much, you know. And um, it, it's, it's amazing that... Uh, there's still a lot of very talented people coming out of there. There always has been. You know, when you look back, I mean, there was Michael Holiday, there was Billy Fury, Frankie Vaughan, Alma Cogan. There's been, a, before the Beatles, that was, you know, there's been a lot of very successful artists come from there. And, and even somebody you may not suspect uh, being, to be a singer, the likes of Ken Dodd. I mean, he had his own fair share of number one singles. Oh, yeah, Ken Dodd, too. I for, I'm sorry, I forgot about Ken. Yeah, what do we be? Tom he's not, O'Connor. Yeah, oh, yeah, another one. I mean, even Tarby used to sing a bit, didn't he? Jimmy Tarbuck, yes. It's a lot of talented people. A lot of comics, though, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's part of the the love and humour, and and that's part of uh, you know being a scouser. We 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 love uh, the, the humour that comes with it, and it's always it it, it it's never you know up itself. It, it you proper down to earth people, hit, and have a laugh at both your own expense and those who try and crush you. Of course, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what ambitions do you still have? What do what do we still need to to see you do? Don't know. I'm I'm happy doing what I'm doing. I'm I'm happy recording and and doing shows. You know, I mean, uh, I'll do another album after this one. That, that's that's as far as I'm looking ahead. You know. Mm-hmm. But you're working on material for that already. Yeah, of course. So where are you finding inspiration for your songs these days? Obviously, we know there was the one you know, paying tribute to uh, Brian Epstein who got into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But what else are you looking at? It's just what I like to do. It's, it's what I what I enjoy doing. You know, I've never considered this to be a job. It's something that I like to do. And while I like to do it, I'm going to keep on doing it while I'm able. Well, that's the way to to, to look at these things. So uh, the the brand new album, as we say, is is out now. And uh, how do we get hold of copies of that? Is there uh, uh, yeah, real vinyl copies too? I, I'm hoping there's vinyl. I've got CDs. People can go get in touch with Billy J. Kramer. Music.com. I mean, yeah, pick up uh, yeah, the the tracks we're looking for there. And uh, I mean. As far as uh, the singles chart goes, you, have you actually got a single release off this one? I couldn't have done it without you as a, a current single. I had uh, uh, Are You With Me it was the first title track which we put out, and now uh, it's I Couldn't Have Done It Without You. And I'm releasing another one called My Sweet Rose. So uh, that that's, uh, again, what we know you for. They're, they're, but they're not quite on 45s these days. They're all streaming and downloads, aren't they? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> I, I miss all that. I don't know about what you think, but you know, I think think it's nice, you know, to have an album and look at the cover and look at the back and see who did what on it. It's you know, interesting. Yeah, and it's uh, it's it's not quite the same, but the music is. That's the important part. It's just as good and sounding fantastic. We'll take a listen to "I Couldn't Have Done It Without You" in a moment or two's time. Before we do that, give us that web address again, where we can find out more about the the current work and grab copies on CD. Billy J Kramer Music dot com. Oh, Billy. Thank you so much for sparing the time to talk to us. And uh, I, we know that you've got another 60 years worth of career you're going to keep writing music for. Yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing that as we go along. Uh, but for now, Billy J. Kramer, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. I 
started alone on a lonely one-way street then you came along with a heart to rescue me and through the years the tears and fears you prove what love can do I couldn't have done it without you you made it real But far too soon you were gone Because of you I always knew That I could carry on I couldn't have done it without you You made every dream come true There's no denying you were my silver Without you, you made every dream come true. There's no denying you were my silver lining in every storm I went through. Somebody helped me be all that I am, so now I can do what I do. You were the one, and I couldn't have done it without you. Now, on the 4th of September, the Enfield Poltergeist will be visiting the New Hampton Heart Centre. It, it will move you, this show. Uh, I think that's how poltergeists work. Kira and Paul join us now to tell us more about what's going on. Hello to you both. Hello there. Hi. So, first of all, tell us a, a bit about the show itself, because this has uh, been part of a fringe festival in the past and is now making its way out on the road. Uh, yes, we started um, about a year ago at Buxton Fringe. And have we been to several fringes since then? Uh, but we're also doing a lot of touring of the UK, uh, doing one night stands, as it were, at, at theatres up and up and down the country. Um, so yeah, yeah. yeah the show's been going for about a, a year and a half now. Well, now I'm I'm seeing various pictures, and I have to admit there's something of a Blair Witch feel about some of the uh, the still imagery that I'm seeing. But uh, obviously, this is much more than that, and it's taking place in front of your very eyes. Uh, that's right, yes. Um, the nice thing about going to the theatre is um, no two shows are the same. And so um, you're, a, you're a part of a, a unique experience when you go to see um, a stage show rather than watching a film such as The Blair Witch Project. And Kira, I, I'm seeing lots of pictures of you looking very spook in the artwork. Tell us quite what you're up to. So I play two characters. One of them is Morris's daughter who died and she's sort of a ghosty character. And then... I play Janet Hodgson, who's more of a mischievous 12-year-old who's being a little evil, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an experience for the audience, though. I mean, although uh, no real poltergeists were harmed in the making of this production, um, it, potentially, uh, the, the there is still an air that will have the hairs on the back of your neck standing tall. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the things that we um, try to do is tell the story, uh, the backstory almost to the Enfield poltergeist uh, incident, which was a, you know, a genuine incident that happened in London, in Enfield, obviously, in 1977. 
um, and we sort of get behind the press headlines of the day and uh, try to focus on the human stories behind what led to this poltergeist allegedly manifesting itself in this council house uh, because the, people, the the investigators and also the girl at the center of the poltergeist activity both had sort of uh, a damaged past shall we say and uh, in, in, in many ways the poltergeist was, was a manifestation of their of their grief so as well as being a bit spooky obviously it is a ghost story we like to tell the story of the characters uh, that were involved with it and what their backstory was as well so obviously when anything's based on truth there always has that extra little bit of magic to it as well i think and uh, as they will leave audiences questioning what really happened and that's part of the tale that you tell uh but uh have there been any spooky goings on on tour because the new hampton arts center has, has that got any ghosts that might be interested in watching too i, I i'm not sure whether you heard any tales um, I, think, I think all self-respecting theatres have got their own ghost stories. I don't think I've ever been to a theatre where, you know, an usher or somebody working there hasn't said to me, oh, we've got a ghost, you know. I think I think, I think most um, theatres have got ghosts. Um, uh, I, I can't, th can you think of any spooky goings on that we've experienced so far with the show, Kira? Um, when we were at Glossop, there was weird noises. Oh, yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that we couldn't explain. And we have been involved in other ghost stories in the theatre where um, spooky things have happened and uh, where one show we were in um, a tap turned on by itself wasn't it and then and, and, and the electrics suddenly stopped working for no apparent reason sort of typical sort of paranormal activity type stuff um, so yes yeah as I say all theatres have got their own ghost stories and uh, I don't think you'd be a respected theatre if you didn't to be fair <laughs> and, and how do you approach this I mean are you doing merchandise as well because that could be an interesting one for this uh, it's, it's, it's not really because uh, you know it's essentially um, me and Kira are <clears throat> the whole theatre company. You know, not only do we perform on stage, you know, we wrote the play, uh, we self-directed, self-produce. I drive the van. Uh, uh, Kira does all the tech, you know, organises all the tech, and uh, we we set the stage ourselves. So it really is a two-person job. So uh, we've got enough on our plate without trying to sell T-shirts as well. <laughs> well, I, I was thinking there might be spirited teddy bears that were out there on the market. <laughs> oh, yes. I think we could have our very own teddy bear. If anybody who's seen the show knows that teddy bears play a very important part uh, in the proceedings. And uh, I said, this is, uh, again, something we don't see a lot of. And I think it harks back to a very much a Victorian tradition of telling ghost stories, usually around Christmas. And we uh, we don't get as many ghost stories as we do love stories. So I think this is, uh, and, and every good ghost story must have a love story at its heart somewhere. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it, it sounds very cliched, I think, or um, a, a bit nauseating. But I always say that um, a good ghost story is at its heart a love story. And um, and the Enfield Poltergeist is no different, really. You know, it's a it's a it's a story of grieving and people, you know, grieving for the loss of loved ones. So the event itself, as you say, is the New Hampton Arts Centre is the fourth of September. Tickets via the New Hampton Arts Centre website. Uh, are they also available through your socials too? Um, you can find out all the details about where we're touring and how to get tickets and updates on the show by following us on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we've got a very sort of active social media presence, which is uh, Kira's department. She's head of social media as well. Else. Um, so if you want to keep up to date, you'll find us very easily on Facebook and Instagram on Enfield Poltergeist Show. Uh, but yes, the New Hampton website has um, tickets available now for the show, which which appear to be selling very well. It's a bit difficult for us to keep up to date because we don't get all the, in, the sort of background info about how things are going. But for what we can make out, tickets are selling very well at the moment. Well, I'd say if you can't make it to Wolverhampton, you'll also be performing in Stafford on the 14th of September. So if you can't do the 4th and you can do the 14th, it's only at the road in Stafford. Other than that, you are right. out and about across the country. It's going to be uh, amazing to see this story brought to life, even if you may never sleep again after you've experienced it. <laughs> uh, Kira and Paul, thank you both for joining us. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks. <laughs> Now, it seems the attitude towards funerals may be changing slightly, with many more occasions with bright colours rather than the traditional black. To tell us more, I'm joined now by Jill Stewart, MD of Funeral Care, and by Paul Chuckle as well. Hello to you both. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. I hope we find you both well. 
Yeah, yeah, very well. You, Joe? All good. Yeah. All good. Right, now, now, first of all, I mean, I have to say condolences, even though I know it's been a while, but, uh, oh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, your late brother, Barry, and uh, <laughs> obviously you two were such fun on stage together, and you allowed that fun to continue into the remembrance service you had for him. Yeah, we certainly did, yeah. I mean, uh, it's always very sad when you lose someone, but as a report by uh, Co-op Funeral Care, shows a funeral doesn't have to be a sad day and, and it really wasn't um we had it uh, the funeral at new york stadium rotherham united's ground and uh, after after the initial you know obviously very very upsetting carrying his uh, coffin in and you know the, the usual bits and pieces but once the day started you know we, all the showbiz friends and family and friends you know, all started talking about the good days, uh, you know, me and Barry. We always had fun on stage. <clears throat> Remember, we, we never did anything without having a laugh at some time on stage, whatever show we did. And, uh, you know, that was a great thing to remember. And everybody had the same sort of things to remember about Barry. And it was, it was a fun day. You know, eventually it was a fun day, mm -hmm. remembering him, you know, celebrating his life. And obviously, uh, I, I know through friends of friends that unfortunately you did have some warning that uh, his time was coming to a close. And I know you worked on Tarlis throughout. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that said, it doesn't make it any easier even when you're able to sort of plan for it with the loved one who you're remembering. Not at all. It was only about eight weeks um, from him telling us. Um, he didn't tell me or his manager about it because... Uh, he knew that we'd have said, get yourself into hospital and get sorted, you know, which uh, obviously he didn't do. He wanted to keep on working and he worked to the end, you know, which is what he wanted. So, you know, always raising a smile. And certainly that was something that you were able to do in his memory on his funeral day. And, and uh, Jill, I mean, a football stadium isn't actually that unusual based on what people want to do when uh, it comes to their funerals from what we're seeing in this survey. No, not at all. I think people are thinking more broadly and lots of people follow football. They've got a real association with a with a local club uh, and it might be a big club. It might be a small club. And, you know, we've we've seen funerals where it might not have been the football club is the venue, but, the you know, the people attending have come wearing the football kit um, in support of that uh, person whose whose life they're celebrating at that funeral so you know there are lots of different ways you know we've done cricket themed funerals before as well as football we've done gardening type focus for funerals it's really just reflecting people's interests and the things that they've actively been involved in or supported in their life because mm. absolutely the, the funeral should be about the person you're remembering and although obviously it is for the family who are left behind you want to reflect their wishes and uh, again paul with uh, in, in barry's case i mean i should think that uh, he'd have been quite proudly looking down on you uh, knowing the day he put together yes it certainly is he's still with me now i know he's still with me uh, not just in the heart he's, uh, he's in my dreams at night and uh, i'm sure that's his way of saying because he never believed in the afterlife, which I always have done. And I think it's his way of saying uh, there is an afterlife. I'm here and I'm still around. Absolutely. And he's been able to look back on the on the memories of that day as well. And, you know, it, it is difficult for every family. and But every family is different. And uh, again... With the obviously twelve point seven percent of people want to have bright colours at a funeral, not right for everybody, but certainly right no. for for many. It seems it's your own choice, isn't it? I mean, you can still have a traditional funeral at any time, you know. Everybody wearing black and uh, maudlin, as they say, you know, having a, a sad day. <clears throat> but um, it's you, you're the star of the show. It's your your day. When it's your funeral, it's your day, and uh, just nice to do something that reflects on your life. Mm -hmm. Me, I, I do a lot of DJ work now, and I want my funeral to be in a, a nightclub, and I want everybody to be dressed up as they're going for a night out, and uh, the DJ in the box will have a mask of me on, so I'll be playing as well at the same time. I love that idea. That's fantastic. I, I, I take it you're going to put together the set list for this one as well at some I'll point. I'll definitely but... do that. I'll definitely do that as well, yeah, so they know it's me completely. Triple <laughs> <laughs> so will be playing. <laughs> but I say it, it's... In, it's about the, the life you've lived, as we say. So, so Joe, I mean, when it comes to co-op funeral care, uh, you've done a, a, a regular survey looking at the music that uh, people uh, choose as well, and no doubt we'll be talking about that later on this year. 
but uh, it, it is it's, it, there during the worst time of anybody's life that they're going through this. But with the right care, it can be so much easier. Yeah, absolutely. And we'd always encourage people to talk to their loved ones about what they'd like at their funeral. So, you know, Paul's given a, a great description of how he'd like to be remembered and what that celebration would look like. But it does help the family at a really difficult time. If they're clear about what sort of music um, that individual perhaps would want want to be played or whether it is that they'd like people to wear a particular colour or... or uh, you know, we've had examples of people dressing up in fantasy dress with Marvel characters. You know, there's any sort of scope of how people can think about it. But the more they've talked about it before the actual funeral uh, is needed, the easier it is for the family. Because it is a difficult time and our colleagues are there to support a family, um, help them, you know, help understand um, the life that, that their loved one experienced and be able to find and help them find tributes and memories that they can celebrate on the day and clearly they want to pay their respects and that it's it is a somber day in many ways but you know they, our colleagues would want people to be able to look back on that day as a real celebration of a life lived a life well lived mm -hmm. yeah i know when it came to my mom and dad it was about five years ago we had a, a conversation about what funeral music they wanted now sadly we lost dad in 2021 and, and uh, uh, mom in 2022 so close together but we we knew what they wanted we knew the mm. service to put together for them and uh, you know there's there's nothing worse than trying to stand up there and do a eulogy and I, I did it for both of them but it wasn't easy but equally knowing how we'd managed the service for dad which worked well for mom and then what we were able to give to her afterwards and our thing was we went for a carvery afterwards and you know that they they both would have loved that dad would have loved to have been there for the carvery mm. he, he actually booked one for my for my nan's uh, post-funeral celebrations and it's just a nice easy way of getting the family together and doing it in a way in which you can share and it's yeah. it's about that sharing isn't it and he was probably there with you in our with carvery I was, I would, he was probably checking up on how much I was spending. I know that much, but there we go. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it is, you know, a time of sadness, yeah. but one it's, we have um, to it, remember it, those good times. Yeah, it's everybody's choice, isn't it? You know, some, as I say, some people want a traditional, you know, type of wedding, but uh, a lot of people, I mean, I fancy the idea of the fancy dress. You can imagine uh, Superman and Batman. I, I, I was there. thinking chuckle hounds, to be honest with you. Well, they could be in there, yeah, of course. <laughs> They're a bit hot, yeah. though, to wear, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Certainly something to do with your younger years. Yeah. So, uh, Jill, we can obviously go online to find out about the full survey. And whilst we're having a, you know, a, a light-hearted conversation here, Carp, look after the serious side of things for us. Absolutely, yes. And people can find out more information at www.coop slash funeral care or get in touch with one of our branches and the team will be more than happy to help either talk about funeral wishes or if then, you know, we can support at a time of need, then then clearly that's what uh, the team would be there to do. And, and and certainly it's one to go along to before you need it. It's it's about having that that uh, you know, funeral parlour of choice. But if you have a, a firm that's done the family for you know centuries, decades, you know, you've always been with a the co-op, then you know where to go to. But certainly if, you know, go along talk about it and, and do that early and, and get someone to make notes so it's it's ready for mm. when that time comes whether you get warning or not yeah we, we can capture wishes for people um so they can share them with their family or we can retain them um but you know it takes some time because you know when, if, when somebody sadly dies the time is is short to be able to make the preparations if you've taken the time to plan it, it helps everybody and it's only a one-off mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. Don't yeah, definitely. The second one. No, and uh, I mean, I mean, Paul, you will be putting your playlist together, and Co-op will be fine with you updating it, sending the information through periodically. Hang on, I know what these three bangers playing just I after we've done the can can. <laughs> Let's put Reach for the Stars. as well just for cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be a, a, an amazing day when it comes. May that be many, many years in the future because you've got loads of people to entertain in the meantime. But uh, for now, Paul Chuckle and Jill Stewart of Co-op Funeral Care, thank you both for joining us. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Harry Matthews has been working on a number of sites. He has a series of books. He's around halfway through and he's journeying through the times of Lillard across the universe, notably in Amsterdam. And he's here to share some of those stories. How are you doing? Very good, thank you. That's the way we like it. So 
first of all, how did you start to approach this project? Because we briefly spoke, <clears throat> what, probably during lockdown, about some of the uh, the work that you've been doing. Uh, yes, poetry. Mm-hmm. What, what, what brought you to poetry? Um, well, it was a combination of being in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. meeting poets, uh, meeting Giselle, who was a Dutch uh, spon sponsor or patron of the arts. Mm -hmm. And uh, she introduced me to uh, the works of um, a poet from Germany. But I, may, I, may, I met some poets in, mm -hmm. in Amsterdam. And when you, you meet creatives like that, it often draws out your own creativity, doesn't it? <clears throat> and I think that was probably, was it a surprise to you to start off with? Uh, or were you kind of expecting something to happen? Well, I wasn't expecting anything to happen. It was just very broadening of my experience to mm -hmm. meet people who were discussing people like Walter Scott and Arthur Rimbaud and Baudelaire and the, the roman German romantic poets such as um, Stefan George and... Um, but, I mean, but when you've got these sort of bodies of work that you approach and read, mm. what then makes you realise that inside you, you've got this sort of level of work? I mean, we've got three books so far, which, which, which are down here, volumes one, two and three. Right. And uh, you know, it's, uh, they're published works with, with an awful lot of, of content in there as well. Yeah. Um, it, it's more than just the words you've got uh, around us uh, all sorts of uh, pieces of, of collage and they sort yeah. of fit in with what you're doing, don't they? Yes, well, I, that's right, Jason. I did, uh, in the aftermath of my time in Amsterdam, I did create a vast uh, collection of collage pages. Mm -hmm. uh, but these, I mean, you've got photos which are taken on film. It's not a digital mm. world, it's an analogue experience and I think that probably again adds to the way the work sort of combined. Yeah there there are videos, there are photos as well as voice recordings and um now I'm just trying to interpret that period of my of Lillard's life mm -hmm. in terms of poetry, in terms of sonnets, but also in terms of prose prose fiction. It's because Lillard is kind of the alter ego of you at the time. Your name was Harry then? But yes. Lillard was travelling with you? Or? Well, Lillard was the name that a friend gave me. Mm -hmm. But essentially Lillard is a persona. But would Lillard do some things that you wouldn't normally? Lillard was, yes, like an alter. Mm -hmm. So, um, an alter ego. And was that an interesting experience in itself? Because, I mean, travelling is, when you're Lillard, somebody without a passport, without a formal identity. Was mm. that a freedom? Well, it was, but I actually changed my name to to Lillard, mm -hmm. and I actually changed my name by by, by um, deed poll, mm -hmm. by um, in the passport agency. My 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 passport name was Lillard. It was like a, a, another identity that I assumed mm -hmm. to to be the character who went to Amsterdam and became Lillard and lived as a journalist and lived a rather dissolute, uh, daring lifestyle in the city. What would you say was the most daring thing that Lillard did? I think probably uh, <laughs> balancing on the rails of the bridge of the Neue Prinzengracht and um, after drinking a bottle of Jägermeister and rather in a daring feat of acrobatics um, slipping backwards into the canal. At least you had a soft landing. Well, at least Lillard uh, had a soft landing, uh, which means we still have you here today to tell exactly, us. Exactly. Well, Lillard did eventually kill himself off mm -hmm. but he evolved into the person I now am which is Harry Matthews and that in itself is a you know is, did you still feel Harry in some way is a an alter ego of who you might then turn into next or no I think I've got a grip on any disassociative identity issues mm -hmm. and I've settled into being myself but at the time I don't think I was myself I was Lillard mm -hmm. <laughs> Which, and Lillard is the persona of the book. And uh, um, I, I think that but, it, it, it is almost like you're telling the story of somebody else's journey. You travelled with them. Yes. But, all, you, but they, they weren't you as such. Yeah, it's almost like being a, an anthropologist or an archaeologist of mm -hmm. a, a former self, mm -hmm. of a former lifetime. So it was uncovering the, the layers of, of this 
uh, other personality that wasn't quite me. Mm-hmm. And from there, we're getting several volumes of work. Now in here, mm. uh, it's sonnets. And what makes a sonnet? Because I'm not as well educated as you. Well, um, sonnet is a song. Mm-hmm. So it's a poem that's a succinct poem of 14 lines mm-hmm. that has the sound of a song because it's the Latin word for song, yeah. sonus, and, excuse me, <laughs> I, I did content myself with writing a very uh, languid free verse poem about Amsterdam mm-hmm. in, within certain conditions of form in a kind of style of a, I know, Arthur Rimbaud season in hell or... Um, in a Allen Ginsberg sort of beat poet, free verse, languid style, mm-hmm. um, with its own internal rhythm. But then I just decided I'd put it all, because it's a very chaotic, very chaotic material mm-hmm. about very chaotic events, I thought I'd condition it within the straitjacket of the form of a sonnet, mm-hmm. which is um, a monument of praise to. Lillard to Amsterdam, his experience in Amsterdam, so it's discussing his experiences, the people, the outcasts he meets in the city, um, in the alternative circuit of drinking and jazz bars and hash and weed and God knows what else, psychedelic experience and philosophical musing. So it's a, it's sort of rite of passage novel conditioned in the sonnet form. Mm-hmm. But it has commentary on the social history of Amsterdam, the topography of Amsterdam, and the things you wouldn't necessarily know about Amsterdam that go on in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And if you're quite a sort of philosophic, sensitive person, it's sort of a a revelation of his thoughts upon himself and life and being, being in his early 20s in a city where he's unknown and he's experiencing life um, in the raw. And there is a lot of life in Amsterdam. There is indeed. It's it's the very life pulse of the Rhine Delta, mm-hmm. or the arsehole of Europe, or <laughs> however you like to uh, define it. Mm-hmm. But it is a place where it's a very open society. People are can be them can be themselves to a degree, mm-hmm. but it's a very um, open-minded society and tolerant so um, it's ripe for exploration but it's as if one's north node north compass is suddenly swung around to south node <laughs> Antarctica and <laughs> there is a certain moral ambiguity in, a, in such a fluid uh, uh, open theatre as mm-hmm. it were of Amsterdam and, and you've written as you say sonnets from that Have you, does that mean you've had a sonnet that you in mind you'd like to share with us now to sort of give a feel of some of that journey? Yes, I'll I'll pick one as, pick one at random. Okay, that sounds like a good way of doing it. But I think the um the the idea of song sonus of the sonnet being you're speaking your experience into existence. Mm-hmm. So going to a going to a new place and living an, an experience that is brought to life through the synchronicity of one's spontaneous engagement with it through mm-hmm. the persona of Lillard, who is a fictional protagonist. So um, this is Sonnet 33, Crossing Dreams. In pursuit of recognition, my spirit inflamed, in Lillard's refuge, my aspirations reside. To Europe's heart, my ambitions aimed, for in its embrace, my dreams confide. Yet dreams are anchored by reality's chain, a visa's way to barrier too steep, a humble request for a chance to attain, the stage where my soul's art may leap. This dream a testament to silent battles fought, in each brushstroke an inner fire caught. Across seas my hopes are tightly knotted, in your support a future brightly plotted. Should you extend your hand bridging seas so wide, in gratitude, my heart will forever reside. And these these moments, are they wholly remembered, or do you have notes, or are you basing what you're writing around those collages you put together? 
Well, I think it's a combination of all those things. Mm -hmm. um, did you keep diaries when you were there? Well, well, at the core of the book is the um, uh, the inspiration of Lillard's story. So mm -hmm. his diary, mm -hmm. the diary that Lillard kept, um, from which most of the sonnets are derived. Mm -hmm. Also, Lillard's um, archive. So his his collage pages mm -hmm. it is, well, it's, it's, it's imagery all with is, text isn't it yeah imagery and text so, ekphrasis so poetry from image mm -hmm. and that's the that's what the, the sonnets are derived from yeah. mm -hmm. and obviously you said that you're halfway through sort of compiling the project we are literally surrounded as we sit in your studio here with uh, pages which are going to become part of future books and you're sort mm. of choosing how this is going to work and so what what is it still to come well um i've reaved together 211 sonnets of the first uh, heroic crown of crowns mm -hmm. so that's 14 uh, reaves of sonnets um times 14 yeah and then i'm doing that thrice so as, as as of this moment in time i've done i've printed and published the first volume which is 211 sonnets mm -hmm. reeved together yeah and then to come is volume three and then volume volume two and then volume three mm -hmm. but they're already prepared so in, and they've they're already written they just yeah. need to be printed so in total yeah. is 633 already sonnets all in. ready reeved yeah in existence, they just need to be turned into the books. Yeah, and the, you know, and you've got and, those typeset already. I know that because I've seen copies. And illustrated, yes. Yeah, but then the remainder is what that another three books or four? Well, they're the prose, they're the novels, prose right. novels yeah. about Lillard's picaresque, re the passage novel uh, journey in in a prose novel. Yeah, so right this, passage, this will be maybe. readable as if we would a traditional novel. But again, it's still got a, a different feel to it. Oh, it'd be rather like a cross between Celine's journey through the end of the night and uh, Irving Walsh's train spotting meets um, Salinger's Catcher in the Rye or Hunter S. Thompson's Fear and Loathing in Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> Same city, so let's see where it goes from there. Yeah. But I mean, good luck with the work that you're doing there. I know that's taking up an awful lot of your time at the moment. Thank you for spending time yeah, to chat today. You. People can find more of your work online, can't they, and, and see more of your world? They can on harryart.co.uk, mm -hmm. my website, and also um, Amazon, Harry Matthews Poetry, will bring up all my books. And there's more than just so, these yeah. three? Yeah, there's a raft of poetry and so, prose, yeah. Check the work out there. Yep. I hope lovely to meet you. Thank you for sharing some of your world with us, and Lillard's world that you're sharing with the, the wider circle. Thank you, Jason. That's all for this week. Thank you so much for joining me. Back with episode 791 next week. I'll see you then. So off for now. Goodbye from the mill bar. 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 Yeah. Goodbye from the mill bar. Yeah.